a cowboy himself, Farnsworth began working as a stuntman in the 40s and became an actor in his own right. He has appeared in more than 300 movies, not counting television. Tonight, he talks to Gary Morton about the sacrifices and satisfaction of cowboy life. Gary Morton is a cowboy. Born 38 years ago in Tuncari, New Mexico. He started riding, roping, and rodeoing as a youngster. By the age of 18, he had a job with one of the most famous of the old-time cow outfits, the Bell Ranch near Tudum Carey. His starting wage was $125 a month plus room and board, which was often as not the starry canopy of heaven. There's another side to Gary Morton. He's not only a poet, he's probably one of the most popular and successful Western artists in the country. And he's been appointed by the governor of New Mexico to serve as chairman of the State Arts Commission. But it's the rough and tumble life of a cowboy that Gary Morton claims is his own. started back, you know, years ago during the glory days of the West and the trail drives and all that. You know, the, the magazines, the, the dime novels, the movies, all those things has raised the cowboy up to hero status. And I think we all kind of want to be cowboys. It's, uh, what more could you ask for? That's right. Then they never seen the northern lights, never seen a hawk Never seen the spring, it's the great divine. Never heard old camp cookie sing. After a few years as a ranch hand, Gary became wagon boss on the Bell Ranch. He played a major role in the Emmy nominated documentary film Cowboy Heaven. I don't think I could stand to see too many people. I was raised in a small town, and even in that small town, I got tired of the people. The people out here are completely different than your city folks. They got a heart as big as your hat. And I, I just couldn't see living with all those people, people passing on the streets every day shoulder to shoulder, and nobody stopped to say hello. The world of strangers. There's nothing there for me. There, cowboy, I hope you're well. Just light from your saddle and rest for a spell. Here are the making so you can roll you a smoke. You're just out of town and I bet you're broke. You looks like old hunger was a riding you hard. So sit down and eat, because you're welcome here, old part. You don't write nothing but whiskey. His wife Susie was camp cook. Well, I think living out in the country and on a ranch, I think one of the greatest things about it is raising your kids. But I think there's a lot to be said about um, cutting your teeth on a rope. Well, I think basically a cowboy's a nature lover, so nature is, is always present. And in the land and the animals you work with, horses and cattle, uh, they have minds of their own, and they, they kind, of, kind of deal you whatever they want to. So 
it's not a job. It's not a vacation. It's a way of life. It, it becomes your life. It's not nine to five. It's two o'clock in the morning. You have to go out and calve out a heifer. Then that's what you do. And you don't begrudge doing that. It's, it's your life. The soft wind sways the whispering grass. The sun sinks low over the western pass. As a coyote mingles his dismal howl with the sad, sweet notes of a lone hoot owl. A hawk soars lazily up on high, a speck of black in a crimson sky. As a nightingale croons his evening song, the gray wolf slinks through the shadows long. The shadows deepen, then the rising moon with its silvery, silvery radiance all too soon dispels the darkness and brings to view the myriad of things of the night anew. Judging by the songs and poetry, at least, uh, many cowboys would like to go back to a world that's long since passed out of existence. But they say as long as there's cows, there's going to be cowboys. Is it still the same as it used to be? Well, yeah, I think we'd all like to go back to a simpler time, but cowboys more especially, uh, back when things were wilder, I guess. Uh, as far as things being the same, no, they're not. Think times have changed, and you no longer have the cattle drives from Texas to Montana. But it still takes good cowboys. There's still a lot of the West that can't be gathered with a helicopter or a sure. motorcycle. It has to be done on horseback. So I don't think I, things have changed, but but not in a, any great manner that, that has really changed the philosophy of the cowboy or. Uh, you know, I think if you talk to a cowboy in the 1880s, he'd say he'd want to go back to the 1860s. Then a sadness grips you like a pall in the silvery gloom where the shadows fall. Then you wonder why you feel depressed. Though you are alone, you have not guessed is because you are a poacher there, unclean, where nature's breast lies bare. And you, with this spot so sweet, so grand, might remain untarnished by human hand. But even this spot shall see the day when it will fall the easy prey of lust and greed, and in the place where yon pine sways in supple grace, an axe-scarred stump will stand instead bowing in shame its branchless head. The work of eons will fall away to the reaper's stroke in a single day. Though the future ages may never mend the scars of greed till the end of end. Anytime you mess with a rope, it's, it's pretty dangerous. I've been tangled up in rope several times, horse bucking and uh, a cow on the other end and that sort of thing. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that can sure cut you in two. You know, I put on that pack trip up at Chama ever, yeah. every summer. And uh, this past summer in June, I, I was attacked by a bear. <laughs> really? Yeah. I was, I was laying in my, my teepee asleep, and a friend of mine owns Bear, and he brought him to camp and was just gonna let him walk around and scare everybody. Well, the bear just ran right up and jumped on my tent. Of course, I had no idea. It didn't scare me a bit, because I had no, no idea what it was. All I knew is something was on top of me and wouldn't get off and kind of willing me around there a little bit. And uh, finally, Dick, my, my friend, uh, they kind of got the, uh, got a rope on that bear and got him tied to a tree and got him jerked off my tent and everything. Uh, I got out of it. But uh, looking at my tent, 
fortunately, I was in my tent and in my bedroll also, which has tarp on it and everything else. And that bear was biting that tent, and it sure got some holes in it. Of course, I didn't, I was kind of, you know, ignorance is bliss, because I didn't know what was after me. I couldn't see it, couldn't get out in the tent to fight with him anyway, so I just laid there. And uh, it was a big joke after it was all done. Well, you could have been hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, it was, it was a good joke. <laughs> Uh, you had some falls. Well, nothing like that. Soon after making Cowboy Heaven, painting seemed to take over in Gary's life. Although the work was more demanding and stressful than riding herd, he decided to see if he could make a living as a professional painter. I used to ride for the outfits and I liked it all too well. But a fire burned inside me with paint and brush, their story I had to tell. Oh, I still make the roundups with my saddle, war bag, and bed. But back home in my studio, the, the punchers never leave my head. I hear the Wranglers ride out together the Ramuda while the stars are shining bright. Pretty soon, a hundred head of horses come thundering through the early morning light. Then the wolf howls at my door, and I snap back to this time and place, and how I wish I was riding with them boys on some wild cow chase. So if I'd rather be riding, why do I paint, you ask? Because to pay a tribute must be my most important task. And when the riding days are over, and I hope in my pictures they will see the days when they were young and agile and the West was wild and free. Or remember some old timer that's crossed the great divide who took them under his wing and taught them the ways of handling stock and all the old songs to sing. How do you, uh Pick your subjects, uh, the people, for example. I guess the main reason is because they're on a, a ranch in the West working today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never lack for ideas or, or anything like that. There's a, there's a painting just everywhere you look on a ranch to me. Yeah, old Don's a great guy. I really respect and admire him. He he sings a kind of music that that uh, really doesn't have a large audience at this time. He sings that music when he could probably be singing any kind of music he wanted to and, and make a lot better living. But he's very dedicated to the cowboy music, and I've been horseback with him and worked cattle with him, and he's a good hand too. See him out there on. Alone. A solitary cowboy from out of the past Riding and singing all by himself Of the old cowboy singers he may be the last With his horse and saddle, his songs and guitar He chases the sun down and sings to the stars Listen to him singing his melancholy strain He's a wandering minstrel of the ranch. Trade whatever's going on on the ranch. And many times, whoever's working on the ranch, like I won't paint a cowboy that's, that's working in Texas on a New Mexico ranch. I will paint him uh, on the ranch in Texas. You know, gear and all that's so important to, to cowboys. I mean, it's the tools of their trade. And if I was to paint a cowboy on, uh, the kind of a saddle that, that he doesn't ride, well, that'd be a total lie to me and to him, too, and he'd tell me about it. So the working cowboy would be your toughest critic, you figure, and yeah. get all the stuff you do. Yeah, and of course, I still, I go and work on ranches, you know, a couple times a year, 
and am one of the cowboys. I, I still draw a paycheck as a cowboy. So I have to hold up my end of the stick. And then I might show them a few paintings I've done or photographs of paintings. And if they see something wrong with it, they'll say, hey, you know better than that. But you still keep your hand in it then, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the art business sometimes is insane, you know, run into openings and receptions and all that sort of stuff. And it sure does me a lot of good to go do some honest work and, <laughs> and sweat a little bit and, and really remember how much the dollar's worth. Frankly, I just like his art a lot. One of the things you have to understand about Gary is that he is from another part of the state not always associated with art. He's from the southern part of the state, from the Rio Dosa area. So I was just interested in his art. I happen to be very much a fan of what they call Western realism. That's what he is as a Western realist. That's my favorite kind of art. And so I was first taken by his art, then taken by him. But once we met, you know, Kathy highly recommends him, and that's how I got the job. So I shouldn't divulge to you that the First Lady is the one that appoints people to commissions, but in this particular case, she did. The governor had a town meeting here in Lincoln, and, and I stood up and asked him some questions about, about uh, the arts in New Mexico, and I was really interested in seeing how the new governor felt about the arts. And I was pretty satisfied with his answers. And the next thing I knew, he appointed me to the Arts Commission. <laughs> All right. <laughs> depending upon who you listen to, and I, I'm not going to give you any numbers, but I would guess that this state alone must rank in the top five in states in terms of art production and art sales. We want this to be an art state. It is. I think we need to promote it more, and so that becomes part of not only of the economy, but the image of the state. I believe the arts impact the state of New Mexico about $500 million a year. And I get that information from an uh, economic impact study with the uh, Arts Commission did. And uh, it's big business. Not only is it big business, it's clean business. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down as one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear though as for that the passing there had really warned them about the same and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on the way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I should be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. <laughs>